Okay, welcome to the Hardy Weinberg um, lab. So today they're going to start learning about um, sort of our introduction into evolution, uh, but, but mostly dealing with genetics, but change in genetic frequencies over time. So I usually start this lab by saying, all right, we're going to start talking about evolution in the next several units ahead. And so let's define evolution. Maybe have a talk about evolution for a minute, have people talk about what they think evolution is. Um, and then I have them sort of, okay, so let's, let's get a definition on the board together, that evolution, marker, evolution is, and people can usually come up with change over time, change over time, and then the question is change in what? What is changing over time? And they might say appearances, the way that they adapt to their environment, and that's all true, but in order for your appearance to change, and for populations to change in appearance over time, what has to actually change? And the idea is that really this change is a change in the genes, change in DNA over time. And we're going to define that even further, that we're talking about a change in allele frequencies. Well, frequencies. The change in the frequency of given alleles, the brown-haired allele, the blonde-haired allele, the, the attached earlobe allele, the unattached earlobe allele, all the, remind them of the alleles they learned about in genetics, the cystic fibrosis allele, the Huntington's allele, that it's a change in the frequency of those alleles in a population over time. That's what evolution is. And so, just a brief discussion about that and say, all right, so today we're going to simulate um, a population, two populations, to see if we can figure out and answer the questions at the top of their guide. So the top of their student guide says, what happens to dominant and recessive phenotypes and genotypes across generations? In other words, the key question is, if a trait is dominant, will it become more frequent over time? Now, most students believe, most people believe, yes. If it's dominant, it's going to become more frequent over time. And so I'd let them answer that question. Are dominant traits the most common? And if they say yes, say, huh, okay, well, let's find out. All right, so don't answer it. Obviously, for UTAs, the answer is no. But for the students, let them think that. All right, well, maybe, maybe. Let's figure it out. So we've got two populations of beads. And this is in their introductory material. You can either choose to have the students read those introductory paragraphs together as a class or have them read it on their own in their groups or, or whatever, but I usually just summarize it for them and then let them go ahead. So we've got two populations of flowers that are growing, one at the bottom of the mountain at an elevation of 2,000 feet and one at the very tip top of the mountain at an elevation of 8,000 feet. And you can see that these populations, they look pretty different, right? But what you want to emphasize is these are not actually the flowers. Each bead does not represent a flower. This is the gene pool. Has anybody heard the term gene pool before? I'm sure they all have. What is a gene pool? So a gene pool is like if I took everybody in this room and I had you all throw your genes into a bucket, into a container, that would be the gene pool if we were an interbreeding population. Okay, now I know that sounds disgusting. But that's the idea, that if you took everybody in North America and you threw their genes into a bucket, that would be the gene pool of North America. But not the people, it's their genes. In other words, their gametes. So if we took all the egg and sperm that could possibly be produced by the individuals and we put them in a bucket, that's the gene pool, what genes we have to choose from. Okay, so in this bucket represents all the egg and sperm that can be produced for this flower population for one given gene that we're going to talk about. So we're talking about flower color. And so the population up at 8,000 feet has mostly white alleles in the population. So if you were to guess what the population actually looks like, students might guess that they're, they're mostly white, the flowers. Okay, whereas the population down at the lower end of the mountain has mostly yellow alleles. And so the population down at the bottom of the mountain are mostly yellow. Oh, and by the way, you need to tell them that yellow is dominant to white. Okay, so most of them are yellow at the bottom of the mountain, most of them are white at the top of the mountain. Um, and so they're going to each, each group, and I would actually have each partnership at a table, like have one be low and one be high at each table. So you've got a low population and a high population working in partnerships at each table. That would actually be really helpful. 
And so TAEs, what you're going to give them is a small cup that's about two-thirds full. I'm going to bring this over so you can see. Okay, so it's about two-thirds full, maybe a tiny bit fuller than that, but that gives you about 100 beads. You don't need to count them out, just estimate. So you're going to fill up these cups beforehand, and so at each table, there will be one cup of, from population one and one cup from population, I'm oh, sorry, population one and one cup from population two. Um, and they need to know in their partnership which population they had, because they're only going to mate within their population, since flowers can't climb the mountain and mate across populations. All right, so they write that down in number two, which population are you in, all right? And then number three asks them to figure out what the individuals in their population are going to be. And before you do that, though, I might actually, and I like to post this to students, why do you think that the flowers up here look different than the flowers down here? Let them think about it. Let them talk to their group. So do a think, pair, share. Say, so, all right, I want you to talk to your group. Why do you think the flower color might be different at the top of the mountain from the bottom of the mountain? Okay, come up with some hypotheses and let them talk about it for a minute and then bring them back as a class. And some of the hypotheses might be that whatever the white flower color, maybe under low um, temperatures, the white flower is, is better adapted to that environment. Maybe there's a predator that eats them and up in the white flower area, the snow kind of, not the show flowers in the snow, but the snow might, might make them camouflage more, whereas the yellow might camouflage more down in the yellow grasses at the bottom of the mountain. Whatever, and there's no right or wrong answer because this is a hypothetical situation, but you want them to start thinking about natural selection, about evolving to fit their environment, okay? So, that would be the hypothesis. So, the next thing they're going to do is they're going to follow the directions in number three. So, I would tell them to do number three and number four and then stop. Okay, you don't want them to do any matings until you've, you've finished what you're doing. So, three and four and then stop. And so what they're going to do is they're going to take their cup and they're just going to pull out two beads at a time and lay them on the table and they're going to count how many of their two bead combinations, because remember a person has two alleles, right, it's got two beads, um, how many of them are homozygous dominant, how many of them are heterozygous, how many of them are homozygous recessive. So I'm going to go ahead and do that and show you the results. Okay.